Thank you all. We will be starting soon in two minutes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Uh, I'm Wafa El Sadr. I'm the Global Director for ICAP at Columbia University, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all today for the ICAP Grand Rounds. We are thrilled today to welcome uh, Dr. Muge Sevik, who will be our speaker, and her uh, talk today is entitled Understanding the Epidemiology of COVID-19, a Global Perspective. Just to tell you a bit about uh, Dr. Um, Sevek um, and um, to welcome her and to introduce her. Uh, so Dr. Sevek is a clinical lecturer in infectious diseases and medical virology. And her research focus has been on HIV, tuberculosis, other tropical infections and emerging infections, including COVID-19 since the advent of the pandemic. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, she, uh, in addition to working at the front lines with the National Health Service, she was also instrumental in guiding the response. For example, she provided scientific advice to the chief medical officer in Scotland and various advisory group on recent scientific developments on COVID-19. She was also a member of the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group, NERVTAG, and also provided guidance documents for the UK's SAGE, which is a scientific advisory group for emergencies. She's also provided advice and various consultancies uh, to the World Health Organization on risk communication during COVID-19. I think importantly, um, during um, COVID-19, in addition to her academic work uh, at the University of St. Andrews, she developed a strong interest in science communication, as uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, on this call have had to do during this pandemic. She's passionate about the issue of the value of integrating scientific uh, communication into our efforts to disseminate research, as well as also to enhance knowledge exchange amongst scientists and the broader uh, public overall. So I welcome Dr. Savick. She will give us her presentation and then we'll follow that with uh, taking your questions and the discussion. So at any time during the, um, the talk, please feel free to put your questions. Uh, make sure that uh, these are targeted to everybody and we will take your questions at, after the completion of the talk. Welcome, Dr. Savick. Many thanks. Uh... Of uh, Al Sadr uh, for this generous uh, introduction. It's an honor uh, and privilege to have been invited to address you today. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee. Um, let me just share my screen. I hope you can see. So I'm basically um, basing this talk um, based on the presentation I've given uh, at Croy this year, uh, but I added some new slides uh, and updates about the new variants uh, as well. I'm sure many of you might remember this PROMED alert uh, posted late on the 30th of December 2019. I specifically remember there were three distinct information in this alert. Uh, it was a cluster, it was viral, causing atypical pneumonia, description, of chest x-ray sounded like SARS-like illness, but that was all the information we had at the time. For me, being a clinician and a researcher in infectious diseases during the pandemic was a unique experience for probably many of you as well. Uh, seeing the progress, uh, but also uncertainty from both sides. So it was really challenging. Um, of course, like we've all been really fascinated by the unparalleled scientific efforts 
uh, by January 17, only 18 days after the initial case report, we had the interim guidelines for diagnostic testing. Uh, we already had clinical description by January 24th. I mean, accumulation of evidence has been extraordinary. The rapid global sharing of findings, best practice, rollout of high quality RCTs have shown the best of what we can achieve collectively. But also there was an imbalance between uh, scientific evidence and the capacity to make sense of it. And that was the time that I was able to see it from a policy and evidence uh, perspective as well. And I think generally handling complex scientific issues in governments is you know, generally not very easy, but it's much more challenging during emergencies and crises like this. Um, but I think much of the good scientific input has fallen aside because uh, there was no means to pick it up in a, in a governmental uh, level. And in addition, uh, as uh, Wafa mentioned, I've, I've been interested about misinformation and uh, disinformation. Um, COVID pandemic, uh, probably the biggest um, public health challenge of our lifetime, has arrived at a time when social media is leading the message. And this shift away from traditional media offered new channels uh, for us to engage with communities, but also created challenges as many of you probably now self-appointed experts without credible authority now have an immediate platform to disseminate untruths, rumors, and conspiracies. And I think this misinformation, disinformation, conflicting messaging have not made things easier, uh, easier either, and it continues to be a big problem. So we've heard this uh, during COVID pandemic a lot. We've heard the statement following the science, which has been used by politicians uh, as a shorthand for a new, better era for politics where government decisions will be uh, based on expert advice. Uh, but is that simple? Uh, and what were the challenges in informing policy? So um, in this talk, I will discuss the global epidemiology of COVID-19, factors influencing transmission, uh, mainly focusing on uh, disparities in transmission severity and outcomes, as well as the challenging epidemiological aspects uh, during the pandemic. Um, and I will also discuss how data could inform policy moving forward with a holistic approach to the pandemic response. So, I want you to get up to speed where we are right now. Uh, colors indicate uh, cases reported by each region. Um, over the last two years, over five, 536 million cases have been reported and 6.3 million deaths uh, globally. As you know, like these numbers are clearly underestimates uh, as the true cases and deaths. Um, these trends, Obviously now, especially should be interpreted very, very carefully because some countries have been progressively changing testing strategies. For example, in the UK, we're not routinely doing testing anymore. Like we had much more, um, you know, uh, daily testing, especially using uh, rapid antigen tests, but we don't do that any, any longer. And many European countries also dropped uh, testing as well. So uh, we may not actually see the true picture at the moment. And I think early in the pandemic, there were, you know, lots of assumptions. We were trying to understand how the pandemic will play out with several scenarios uh, being depicted. But when we look at the patterns across regions, we can see that heterogeneity is quite striking. I mean, some countries had repeated waves, peaks and troughs over time. Some countries haven't been able to control and uh, the, that peak, some had sustained control on the experience in community transmission in 2021. So really what we've learned over the last uh, two years is there's no single global epidemic, but rather a multitude of diverse epidemics. So we can say that there's no single prescription that can apply to all, all countries uh, that are as diverse as, 
uh, diverse as South Africa, UK, Denmark, and US. But what we know for sure is that COVID has stressed health systems beyond their capacities uh, before the wide availability of vaccines. Well, over 100 countries tried to flatten the curve by uh, lockdowns to preserve health system capacity, by, but pushed infections into the future. These challenges, in a way, were unsurprising because when we look at Global Health Security Index uh, in 2019, uh, we can see that health system uh, health systems were the lowest performance uh, area uh, overall for pandemic planning. So this fundamental weakness continued in 2021 index as well. So this will continue to be the biggest challenge when we uh, face the next pandemic as well. But we know that wide availability of vaccines, of course, as well as the COVID-19 treatments have transformed the pandemic trajectory. While the link has not been completely broken, uh, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are not no longer following the same trajectory. Uh, this is a new study that was published in Lancet ID recently, you might have seen. Uh, this uh, modeling was looking at deaths averted due to vaccination in the first year of the pandemic. And uh, what they found is approximately 15 million deaths in 185 countries were prevented based on official reported deaths. But if we actually look at um, estimate of true extent of the uh, pandemic by looking at excess mortality, you can see that you know, this estimate rose to almost 20 million. Um, so it kind of shows that global reduction of 63% in total deaths uh, have occurred in the first year of vaccinations being available, which is extraordinary, I think. Um, what we've seen early uh, in the pandemic, uh, obviously different countries had a different outcome, and this was mainly you know, the based on outcomes, uh, looking at the vaccine coverage in over the age of 60s, because when we look at uh, risk of mortality, it's almost 65 times more among elderly. And we saw this in the US early last year, when uh, the vaccination rates were really low in over the age of 60s. And the um, generally death rates, mortality and hospitalizations were much, much higher in the US. Uh, and this, as you can see, the data show, you know, large pockets of unvaccinated population. And this was a really nice, I think, analysis from the Financial Times, looking at what could have happened, you know, if we had much better vaccination coverage in the US, uh, if it matched Denmark's vaccine coverage. So there's a big gap. Uh, in terms of like what happened and what could have been averted. So I guess although COVID and 1918 influenza pandemics stand alone in morbidity and mortality, the frequency of infectious disease emergencies will definitely increase, uh, making it crucial for us to understand the patterns of pandemic virus spread. For example, when we look at uh, 1918 pandemic, almost all countries experienced only one or two waves, you can see here, um, during 1918, but several other confusing patterns were also seen, including summer to autumn epidemics with very low mortality, and then fatal waves delayed for several years beyond 1918, maybe similar to what we're experiencing now, because with Omicron, we've had really high hospitalization rates, almost similar to what we've seen early in the pandemic in the UK. So really, you know, it's very difficult to come up with a, a, a single uh, wave or what's going to happen. But th this is the reason I think understanding these factors associated with transmission uh, and understanding the. Uh, the epidemics and forecasting future pandemics is really, really important. So what are the factors influencing transmission? Uh, what we know so far is that transmission risk 
is multidimensional and it depends on several factors, including host factors uh, related to infectivity, susceptibility pattern, viral load in relation to disease course and environmental factors. These dynamics are greatly influenced by structural factors uh, from network patterns, crowded housing, power, poverty and uh, job insecurity, for example. So making epidemiological sense of these patterns uh, becomes very difficult as viral host and environmental factors may interact in complex ways, uh, such as changing balance between aerosol versus droplet transmission during different seasons, gradual vi virus evolution and growing population immunity. And I think that's why it's becoming much more difficult to compare different country uh, you know, uh, cases and hospitalizations now, because these factors are greatly influencing everything. But what we know is that contact patterns are crucial in understanding transmission. We know that proximity to index case uh, influences the risk of infection. We've consistently seen higher risk among household members, increased duration of exposure among uh, households have been seen also uh, leading to increased risk of infection. Uh, we also learned that certain activities are associated with increased risk, such as dining, group activities, singing and shouting. Crowding is a well-recognized risk factor. That means you're exposed to multiple infectious people as well as network dynamics, as the risk increases with having a large network. And I will come into time of contact later on. So looking at viral dynamics, for example, patients with SARS-CoV-2 have been highly infectious just prior to or around the time of symptom onset. And uh, this observation is also supported in contact tracing studies demonstrating majority of transmission events actually happen within the first five days after symptom onset. Um, and while there have been concerns about transmission risk later in the disease course, you know, people have been testing positive uh, after day five uh, of symptom onset. This is a really nice study recently published in CID uh, looking at uh, contact tracing data from Boston area. And actually what they found is that majority of patients um, were actually culture converted by day six. Only 17% of patients had culture positive uh, after day six. And uh, the latest day they were positive were day 12. So in a way we can say that majority of, you know, transmission happens early on and potentially majority of patients, almost, you know, 17%, uh, only 70% are left with a positive uh, rapid antigen test. Although, you know, it doesn't necessarily correlate with transmission potential, but there is some correlation although. Uh, but we could say that majority of patients can actually leave uh, isolation after day five. Uh, and I think in the US, there's a suggestion to uh, use masks between day six and 11. So that would fit with um, this, this data. So virus evolution uh, influenced the pandemic trajectory, I think significantly. Each year started in the shadow of a new threat, alpha followed by beta and delta in 2021, and finally Omicron. And Omicron variant has a significant uh, growth advantage and it was rapidly spreading globally. And now we also have new, uh, new um, variants as well. I will come into that. And the uh, transmission advantage of Omicron is largely told to be due to Omicron's ability to evade immunity following infection and vaccination. But some studies also show changes in symptom profile you can see that uh, you know, patients with Omicron have increased sore throat, decreased cardinal symptoms like fever and loss of taste and smell. So in a way, higher occurrence of subclinical symptoms may also result in lower detection rate. Uh, so may further contribute to transmission as well. So it's, it's really, really complex. It's not only important to look at the uh, 
uh, transmissibility, but how the severance actually changed the symptom profile um, and also transmissibility and uh, viral dynamics overall. And uh, now in countries with large BA1, BA2 wave, we are seeing BA4 and BA5, uh, which seems to be increasing globally. Uh, while there are no studies on relative transmissibility compared to BA1 and 2, um, I mean, you can see that BA5 arrived in several countries like Switzerland, Portugal, UK, and push, pushing the effective reproduction number above one at the moment. And I think overall, you know, the, the variants we have um, circulating today, uh, these two seems to be clearly the most competitive, you can see that. And in a way, you may, you may be seeing some of the uh, trend in some countries like in Spain and US, there seems to be an overall trend of declining numbers, but I think it's kind of masking the rise of BA5 uh, beneath the surface. So it's really important to uh, keep, uh, keep an eye on that. And I guess like what, we should be expecting from this uh, variant. And uh, so I guess like looking at overall what happened in South Africa, they had a rapid wave, uh, which wasn't really, um, uh, you know, it didn't really cause much hospitalizations, but it's important to note that they have a young population overall. And uh, this wave lasted only eight weeks. And I think South Africa has technically exited Omicron BA4-5 way uh, at the moment, but I think it has arrived to Europe just now. Uh, what we can say is that looking at this breakdown of dynamics, uh, I think we, will going, we are going to see cases and hospitalization and deaths turning back up over the next couple of weeks. I think generally it's driven by the growth of this variant with a 79 day doubling time. Uh, but looking at South Africa, uh, I'm more on the optimistic side, but you know, I hope that it will apply to many European countries uh, with good you know, vaccination rates and booster rates. But I think still we will be struggling with even small number of increase in hospitalizations will push the health system beyond its, uh, its limits. So it's really, really important to also uh, keep these cases under control, probably just going into fall uh, this year. I guess like how this variant is going to affect the vaccines is very important. When we look at vaccine effectiveness against Omicron variant, this is BA1 and BA2. So this is uh, looking at 22 studies from 10 countries. We've seen that, uh, you know, uh, vaccine effectiveness reduced against Omicron variants overall. But once uh, the patients receive a three dose regimen, like the booster, you can see increase, increase vaccine effectiveness for severe disease, symptomatic disease and any infection. But we're seeing, you know, uh, veining immunity against symptomatic disease and infection within three to six months. So it's, it's a concern, although you can see that severe disease protection remains more or less, you know, same. So what may happen with uh, this new variant? Um, so there's been a lot of studies looking at neutralizing antibody titers. Some studies showed lower neutralizing antibody titers compared to BA1. Uh, but this study from the UK showed similar cross-reactivity compared to BA1. And uh, they, when they looked at um, breakthrough zero, uh, breakthrough uh, with BA1 and 2 gave the best neutralizing antibody and activity against BA4 and 5. So in a way, this data suggests that boosting with an Omicron specific uh, booster with a BA1 or 2 booster should be a viable strategy for inducing cross-reactive immune response against uh, future variants. And this is the um, Moderna Omicron-specific vaccine. Um, this is the uh, bivalent 
wild type and BA1 vaccine. Given as a booster, you can see uh, it shows quite good neutralizing antibody response. But um, I think it will be a bit challenging because potentially, you know, having a booster with BA4 and 5 will provide much better neutralizing antibody response. But what will be the clinical significance and the difference uh, still remains, uh, you know, unknown. Uh, I think FDA committee will be, to, uh, will be uh, meeting today to discuss uh, variant specific COVID vaccines. And the decisions will, um, you know, depend on the vaccine composition, but what, which one could be available by fall, because that's the time we should be giving booster vaccines to especially vulnerable populations. So moving on to the other factors, uh, apart from variants, I think we talk about variants all the time uh, in terms of affecting transmission dynamics, but this has been one of the important factors that I've been trying to focus on during the pandemic, uh, and it's the heterogeneity in transmission risk. So um, this is a fundamental principle of infectious disease transmission dynamic. There are no infectious disease, as you know, um, that affects everyone equally. From TB to HIV, uh, we're seeing the same kind of uh, the structure, structural factors with COVID as well. There's so many shared dynamics and inequalities. And this figure shows how we think about risks in general. Uh, what's a person's risk of exposure and accusation risk? And what's the size, what's the size of that community? Onward transmission, the number of downstream, uh, downstream infections that happen if we don't address that person's vulnerability. And severity of infection, there's a structural element as it includes access to services and as well as uh, living conditions. So we often hear about one overall incidence rate, uh, but it's much more complex than that. It's not distributed homogeneously across the society. And acquisition risk depends on multiple factors from family size to ethnicity. Interestingly, in an analysis from Canada, when adjusted for unmeasured confounders, disparities associated with racial disparities disappeared. So this basically shows that consistent relations remain only for essential worker status, number of people living in a household, educational attainment, suggesting that disparities seen in transmission risk are mostly associated with structural factors than biological ones. And some of the differences in risk of transmission could easily be explained by complex network patterns. For example, in, in this case, like case A and case B, you can compare it onward transmission risk from someone who can work from home, like in case A, have enough space for self-isolation at home, maybe minimal, because overall cumulative contacts will be minimal. Um, transmission risk will be very high for someone with a large network due to working and living conditions, including crowded housing and limited opportunities for self-isolation. And these network dynamics are evident in mobility data. In this analysis, we can see mobility varies by neighborhood income, a similar pattern observed in many countries. If you look at completely at home population, uh, the income differential completely reversed after March. So those in highest income quantile who were least likely to stay home before were more likely to stay home after March. And the disproportionate risk associated with network dynamics have also led to differential disease burden. These factors include residents in low income areas, healthcare access and ethnicity. So it's now clear that individual heterogeneity uh, has large effects on disparities seen every stage of epidemic cascade from risk of exposure to disease burden. So what were the challenging aspects of the pandemic? Um, I think for much of 2022, 2021, people were saying they were, uh, there were very few infections in certain regions, especially in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but in fact, they just weren't being tested. So surveys show that many infections are greatly missed. So looking at, for example, these surveys from Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, 
Um, I think overall random sampling or wastewater sampling will provide better understanding uh, of the infection burden. Similarly, uh, deaths are substantially greater than estimates as well. Uh, most reported deaths greatly underestimate the disease burden. Looking at this analysis uh, from India uh, using a nationally representative survey that showed approximately 30% excess mortality. Uh, extrapolating to the Indian population, this equates to the deaths of more than 3.2 million people. And early in the pandemic, there was an assumption of relative homogeneity in risks of infection, equal reach of interventions across population. In reality, risk factors concentrate among the relatively few. In these model, um, my colleagues from Canada show that prevention gaps are created by a one size fits all approach that lead to unequal reach effect across communities. But even if we try to have equal reach across different networks, while we see an overall reduction in infection rates, it leads to a greater inequality over time. So the only way to fill this gap, gap is with more resources that address underlying determinants of increased risk, like housing, paid sick leave, etc. So in a way, leveraging network heterogeneity in models uh, and also in real life policy decisions will better you know, uh, address these differential risks. And settings and modes of transmission has been one of the challenges of the pandemic because you know, it requires data from multiple approaches. When we look at uh, its single evidence it may be skewed towards setting where data is available. We've seen this, for example, with uh, school related contact tracing studies, because you know, all, the, all the school kids will be associated with the school environment, but we may not be able to say that uh, the infection actually happened in that environment. So it's so important to look at the evidence from a general perspective, outbreak investigation, case control studies, surveillance studies, lab studies, modeling, that will give us a much better understanding about setting and modes of transmission. And the proportion of asymptomatic infection has been another challenge because uh, we've had absence of comprehensive understanding, uh, which made it very, very difficult to inform public health strategies of the best way to control the pandemic. Many studies were biased. For instance, case definition was uh, incomplete. Uh, Follow-up periods basically didn't account for pre-symptomatic individuals. When you do a retrospective uh, symptom analysis, there's a recall bias. And uh, when we look at um, actually different studies, we may actually find different estimates. For example, seroprevalence studies generally have higher uh, proportion of asymptomatic individuals, whereas contact tracing studies generally show lower uh, prevalence of asymptomatic individuals. So according to studies taking into account these biases, approximately 20% of people remain asymptomatic. That's completely asymptomatic even during follow-up and asymptomatic individuals are actually less infectious than uh, symptomatic individuals. But of course, I think the main challenge has been pre-symptomatic infections and pre-symptomatic transmission, which is very, very difficult to capture as well. And vaccine effectiveness has been challenging to assess in real time because uh, considering pressures influencing epidemic dynamics, variant transmissibility, human behavior, immunity status. So it's so important to think about different factors that could affect vaccine effectiveness. For example, high levels of community transmission early during Delta wave uh, led to an observed drop in vaccine efficacy against Delta because you know uh, exposure per person increased during that time. So it's so important to take this into account when assessing vaccine effectiveness. 
So moving forward, uh, I'll just touch base on four <laughs> important topics. Um, so first of all, SARS-CoV-2 is unfortunately here to stay. Uh, the idea of eradication, uh, eradicating any infection is hugely appealing, but COVID-19 currently meets basically no established criteria of a virus that could be eliminated. So meeting the biological uh, criteria is only one step in the decision as health resources are limited and uh, resources cross sectors. It's clear that virus um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 will be circulating for a long time, but the, with, with the vaccines, it's becoming and become, became in a, in a way more manageable threat. So I think moving forward, we need to focus on interventions that will provide the most benefits with less disruption without amplifying or concentrating risks among the most vulnerable. Unfortunately, the most important milestone to achieve going forward, again, continues to be um, uh, equitable vaccine coverage. While at least 55% of global population have been fully vaccinated, global rollout has been shamefully uh, inequitable more boosters have been given in high country, high income countries than total doses in low income countries. This continues to be a challenge. And overall, going forward, addressing competing health risks will be crucially important. During the pandemic, estimated 75 million people entered extreme poverty, 80 million more undernourished compared to pre-pandemic levels, more than 1 billion children are at risk of falling behind due to school closures. So COVID pandemic reversed the years of, of uh, progress uh, made in the fight uh, to end TB. And again, like long COVID is a big challenge coming uh, you know, in the future. This will be a big challenge for health system and capacity. And um, there's been interruptions in HIV prevention, treatment services, so we will be living with the consequences for decades to come. So when we think about COVID uh, as a threat of a once in a lifetime, uh, it's important to remember that we're living in an era of pandemic threats. So we need sustainable responses while focusing on recovery to prepare for the next pandemic as well. Disparities that have defined COVID epidemiology could have been easily readily predictable. More worryingly, vaccine engagement is weaker amongst uh, disadvantaged groups. And crucially, this is a logical consequence of structural disadvantage and discrimination. So we need to remember that uh, moving forward, understanding the unmet needs and providing resources to address them should be the guiding principle of pandemic response. So I guess like I want to go in a bit more detail about how do we look holistically to pandemic response. Uh, complex problems require complex and systematic solutions. So original Swiss cheese model was developed by James T. Reason. Uh, some of you who work in uh, healthcare uh, infection control might know this quite well. Uh, so he basically tried to explain the occurrence of system failures, which we often use you know, in a hospital setting. So person approach focuses on the errors of people. Countermeasures are directed mainly at reducing unwanted human behavior. These methods often include poster campaigns that they appeal to people's um, fear, uh, you know, sense of fear, blaming, shaming. And some of you might remember the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign for HIV awareness, which was considered disastrous in terms of stalking stigma and fear. So in contrast, system approach, uh, in, in the system approach, the errors are seen as a consequence rather than causes. So countermeasures are based on assumption that we can change the conditions under which humans work. So what does that mean? So in a way, uh, when we look at some of the great, uh, you know, initiatives done during the 
COVID-19 pandemic. This is a test and cure model in San Francisco, address many of the logistical and financial barriers to self-isolation faced by socioeconomically disadvantaged population. When we look at this intervention, uh, it was not only feasible and acceptable, but also 67% of participants requested support to self-isolate, but trust in the scheme improved over time as well. So when we look at system approach, it looks at the upstream causes. You know, while COVID Swiss cheese is good intended and uh, is often shared to show no single intervention is perfect, but it also implies that catching the virus may be a result of human error. In contrast, this is reason's original Swiss cheese that places the emphasis on a series of systematic failures that are all preventable. You know, when an adverse event occurs, the important issue is not who is to blame, but how and why the defenses have failed. And the last and the last bit I want to touch base on is evidence synthesis, because I think this has been the most challenging aspect that I've come across during uh, my, um, you know, uh, kind of time advising the government. The high speed and the scale of ev evidence generated uh, has been very challenging for decision makers. I mean, not only for decision making, makers, but clinicians and public. So this is mainly because of the difficulty in synthesizing all these data in a timely way. So I think creating better synthesis needs to be governmental priority as the crisis move into new phase. And we need to develop new tools to systematically review data in real time. So in reality, uh, following the science is complex because science is a tool, not a prescription for policy. Policy combines science with values and priorities, and it's also influenced by public opinion. That's why I think uh, physicians and scientists engaging in public dialogue is so important. And I think uh, moving forward, pandemic has shown us the urgency of challenging our understanding and use of evidence-based medicine. Situations such as pandemics are complex, raising complex questions with often complex answers, highlighting the need to make space for a different paradigm, moving from opinion-based to evidence-driven uh, policy formulation. So in conclusion, COVID-19 is marked by heterogeneity in risk of infection and spread across people, places, and time, refocusing our collective attention away from the needs of marginalized and underserved groups, risks exacerbating existing health inequalities. Carefully planned original studies that can answer important questions are needed rather than multiple small scale studies that are not really going to answer some key questions. That's something we've had, I think, throughout the pandemic. Concerted efforts to improve theory and practice of sophisticated data synthesis is needed going forward. And we really urgently need to invest, uh, invest in and maintain resilient health systems because I think this will be the weakest point when the next pandemic arrives. So we need sustainable responses without amplifying risks among the most vulnerable. And these are my acknowledgements, my clinical research colleagues uh, in the UK and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I had the pleasure of working with many um, uh, international colleagues uh, and some colleagues from our systematic review group. Uh, thank you so much. Wow. Thank you very much, Muge, for a superb uh, presentation. Very, very much appreciated. Um, so we're going to go and now into um, your, some of your questions and, um, and comments. And uh, maybe I'll start with a question uh, regarding the, um, the value of booster doses. Um, as you know, and has been shown, and you showed that um, there is waning of uh, protective antibody levels over time after vaccination. How important? Uh, do you believe um, booster doses are and should it be a major priority? And I think the question is uh, probably for uh, 
countries, um, maybe resource limited countries, uh, as well as high resource countries? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think it's a uh, debatable topic. Everyone has a different opinion, uh, of course. Um, but I guess like uh, what we've seen in data, looking at the clinical vaccine effectiveness, mm -hmm. uh, not looking at neutralizing antibody response, we can actually see that, uh, you know, I think once, uh, I mean, you receive three doses uh, and, uh, you know, patients less than 65 without any other comorbidities, I think they achieve the maximum benefit after three doses. So, uh, but things may change with new variants. I mm -hmm. think in uh, high income countries, potentially those who are healthy, less than 65, may not need at fourth dose, but uh, those immunosuppressed or those who are not actually getting the best benefits from the repeated doses may need it uh, for the fall. Uh, I think for uh, low income countries, it's a much bigger challenge. I mean, I'm currently in Uganda running a study here. They just started booster doses here. I mean, they're just giving third doses uh, to vulnerable groups mainly. So it's, it's going to be a big challenge. I mean, they, mm -hmm. you know, I think high income countries are already moving to port doses and they're, you know, they're just uh, catching up with boosters. I mm -hmm. think this will be a big challenge, but I, I generally think that port doses uh, are generally not needed for the general population, but we should start with concentrating on high risk populations mm -hmm. who are at risk of hospitalization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think uh, obviously this is going to get even more complicated now that there's a potential of uh, um, variant specific uh, vaccines as well. Um, so that will even yeah. complicate further the, um, the calculus moving forward. Another question, um, and this gets at um, one of the issues that uh, you, you touched on, which is the, the, what has been reported as, as, you know, as one of the reasons or do we have any more clarity as to why it appears that COVID-19 has had has has not had as as um, as profound an impact um, in uh, sub-Saharan African countries? Uh, many people have raised a variety of different hypotheses, but any any new insights into uh, why we have not seen the morbidity and mortality in particular with COVID-19 in some of these countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. Uh... I think, yeah, one is, I think we haven't had good surveillance in these countries. This mm -hmm. is uh, one reason. But I think the other is, uh, these are kind of, uh, you know, kind of developing countries with very young population. Uh, I mean, for example, in Uganda, almost 50% uh, of population is, uh, you know, less than 25. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's very different than uh, a developed country. Uh, where, you know, we have really high, um, you know, elderly population. And, you know, I can talk from a UK perspective, you know, we've seen a lot of mortality in nursing homes, for example. Uh, you know, even, even after vaccine, there's been a decline, but because those vulnerable groups are still at risk, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, there, there will be a disproportionate risk in, I think, developing countries overall. Um, but also, I think some some governments, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, uh, wanted to hide the actual numbers is in some of the African countries because you know their their income depends on uh, you know uh, tourism. Uh, so mm. it's it's always like we need to think about eco economical perspective of pandemic response as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question regarding tuberculosis, and as you mentioned, there's been enormous concern about the impact of COVID-19 on case detection and, and, and other parameters in, TB, in TB control. But one of the, the audience is raising the question as to whether there's been, uh, there are any data or modeling that you are aware of that looks like the imp impact of the, um, of the measures put in place to control COVID, you know, the um, masking, the uh, um, the distancing and so on, and and whether that has had an impact on a respiratory, another respiratory infection like TB. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We actually did a TB COVID study in Uganda uh, mm -hmm. that was um, funded by NIHR. 
uh, global uh, fund. And uh, so what we found is actually uh, it didn't have much impact on TB. It's because mm -hmm. the thing is TB is generally transmitted in households and, uh, and it's associated with poverty. And uh, so these kind of generally, when we look at structural inequalities, this has been widened over the last two years, unfortunately. And for example, due to the COVID pandemic related restrictions, people were more likely to stay at home with their you know, sick household members. And they were less likely to come forward to healthcare facility uh, because of the fears of catching COVID-19. So what we've seen in Uganda is delayed diagnosis of TB, more uh, increased secondary attack rate in households mm -hmm. uh, of TB. Uh, and also, you know, because of delayed starts, uh, delayed TB treatment, uh, we may actually see in a couple of years time much increased mortality due to TB. So Stop TB Partnership says uh, we will see almost 6.3 million more TB related deaths over the next 10 years. So, um, but maybe uh, it might have had an impact on other uh, infections like flu. But my colleagues are doing some study in Ghana. They've uh, actually noticed much more uh, flu related deaths and hospitalizations in Ghana. So, but it may be that because some of the pandemic restrictions haven't been actually implemented in some of the African countries. So um, it's very difficult to understand these uh, patterns, but uh, hopefully we will have more data from Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, so, great. Yeah. Another question is, as, you, as you're well aware in the context of the HIV pandemic, um, the, the use of treatment uh, as prevention, um, the test and treat kind of a strategy has been obviously prioritized uh, because of the evidence of decreasing uh, transmission with viral load suppression. Uh, what about, um, how do you see the role of treatment in terms of epidemic control, meaning uh, use a similar strategy, test and treat people with, um, with COVID um, as a strategy to uh, control transmission? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like uh, we have very limited uh, treatment options that actually reduce the um, infectiousness period. So some of the antivirals are useful from that perspective, but it needs to be given very early during the disease course. And generally, I think there's been a delay in diagnosis uh, because patients generally wait a couple of days and, you know, by the time they actually approach to healthcare facility or get tested, their viral load is already uh, on, on a down, downward trend. I think, I mean, for respiratory infections, similar to SARS-CoV-2, which is being transmitted in the pre-symptomatic phase, I think it will be very difficult to control that with the uh, treatment only. Uh, but I guess like uh, if we can, reduce uh, the reproduction of the virus in immunocompromised hosts, there's a chance that we could reduce the emergence of variants. Because you know all these variants, uh, there, there was a recent nature paper from South African colleagues showing that probably BA4 and 5 also emerged in, a, in an immunocompromised host. So I think maybe you know, some of those treatments could be you know, uh, kind of uh, directed, tar given targetedly to those populations. But I think, again, like giving the treatments in high income countries are not really going mm -hmm. to help because, yeah. you know, these variants are emerging in, the, in some of the low income countries or countries where there's not much surveillance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a challenge, obviously, because of the need for very early diagnosis and particularly in the yeah. asymptomatic phase, yeah. Uh, yeah. Another question is, um, you know, the, as you know, masking has, has, has been a very um, interesting and controversial topic. And can you um, anticipate or, or uh, share with us your thoughts in terms of uh, masking and its role in, um, in control of, uh, of COVID-19? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, Probably early in the pandemic, it had the biggest impact, uh, I have to say, because, you know, uh, by time, all these variants have become much more transmissible 
So uh, overall, probably reducing the you know kind of overall impact of masks. But I I still think that you know especially these should be implemented in certain environments that we know that it could be helpful, like in crowded environments. But it also depends on you know the acceptability in the population. It's uh, you know I guess like for example in some countries. Uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, they continue to wear masks, etc. For example, in Uganda, they continue to use masks mm -hmm. in uh, indoor indoor spaces. I try to use it outdoors because there's so much pollution here. <laughs> so, I mean, it reduces some of the particles coming into your lungs overall. Uh, but how much that's going to stop infection occurring is still, I think, uh, you know, probably minimal. Overall, when we look at, you know, total, total reduction masks, uh, you know, enabled is uh, probably around 10 to 30 percent. So, you know, wh when we look at each NPI, uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention, they add on to the overall, you know, reduction in infections. Uh, so I think going forward, as I said, like uh, potentially we need to think about like systematic solutions. Like, for example, sick leave, uh, you know, supported uh, sick pay. So this doesn't still exist in many countries, including UK, you know, which is a high income country. Many people are reluctant to stay home because, you know, they, they, they don't get their income. So mm -hmm. I guess like we I, I'm I'm supportive of, you know, NPIs, but I think on the long term, thinking about like uh, long term pandemic planning probably we need much more kind of sustainable solutions that could help um, for future pandemics as well. Thank you. And maybe the last question, and um, I, I'm sure you have seen uh, the paper recently uh, that was published that uh, looked at the various variants and their characteristics, um, and, you know, as they've evolved over time. And what we've seen is an increase in, trans, in transmissibility, that the, the variants are becoming appear to be becoming more transmissible. Now, looking kind of in your crystal ball, um, we've been fortunate that we haven't had uh, at least variants with substantial increase in, in virulence. And uh, first of all, can you comment on why do you think we're seeing more of these uh, more transmissible variants? Well, at the same time, we haven't really seen um, uh, obvious, obvious increase in, in, in virulence uh, with new variants. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it's it's a difficult question. Um, I have to say, uh, but I guess like what well, what we've seen, alpha has become uh, a bit more virulent because we've seen that uh, you know patients infected with alpha were almost two times more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, although when they were hospitalized, uh, the outcomes were similar. So I think like the you know hospital management was pretty good, even though it increased the virulence. Uh, we've seen some decrease in uh, lung uh, involvement, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with some new variants, for example, like Omicron, it, it was potentially affecting upper respiratory tract more than uh, lower respiratory tract. So I guess like, uh, it's really difficult to predict what's going to happen. There will be more variants. And uh, what we've seen over the last two years, it's becoming much more transmissible because that's much more in benefit of the virus overall. I think, you know, it likes to, you know, reach more people, I think, uh, in general. Um, so, but it's very difficult to predict. Um, and what we've seen is uh, most of the mutations happened in the spike protein uh, mm -hmm. that had an impact on uh, transmissibility. Um, and uh, and it's I think in the future there I think it will become you know the variants will become more transmissible and they will have much more uh, you know uh, evasion um, you know I think capability um, because you know this is the first time we're <laughs> kind of monitoring what happens to a virus under huge immunity pressure uh, over time we haven't actually monitored any virus in detail like this mm -hmm. before. Uh, 
So maybe similarly, other viruses have gone through similar mutation mm -hmm. process, but we actually don't know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm also <laughs> kind of uh, wasting. I wasn't expecting BA four and five to be mm -hmm. this much uh, rapidly increasing in all countries, to be honest. But you know, uh, it happens. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. I want to really express our, yeah. our appreciation for uh, for you joining us today and for your excellent presentation. And uh, obviously, the the story of COVID continues. And uh, hopefully, we'll get you back uh, to give us an update, maybe in a few months or so. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I hope you join us in the next ICAP Grand Rounds. Have a good day, everyone.